Hi, this is Dr. Len Calabrese. I'm a professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine and the R.J. Faisenmeyer Chair of Clinical Immunology here at the Cleveland Clinic. This is the yellow line in which we will discuss the rigorous scientific requirements for developing a biosimilar and how those requirements parallel the requirements that the manufacturer of a biologic must meet each time there is a change in the manufacturing process of a biologic. So I'd like to start with just kind of comparing and contrasting the regulatory pathways for small molecule drugs, which we're all pretty familiar with, and biologics. You know, on the left, we know small molecules. These are oral medications. A application is applied to the FDA. A rigorous clinical pathway is engaged in, and the drug is ultimately approved. Over time, when the patent expires, people make generics of these drugs. Generics are literally carbon copies of the original small molecules. They're identical. They merely have to demonstrate that there's a, a unique similarity. No safety or efficacy data is required, and we have many of these generic drugs, as you well know. Biologics and biosimilars are different. Biosimilars are not generics. Biologics these recombinant uh, proteins, many of which are monoclonal antibodies, that go through a rigorous pathway of basic and clinical trials that demonstrate both uh, pristine uh, chemistry as well as efficacy uh, in target diseases. Each disease for which they are approved requires a, a, a significant trial, and ultimately, this drug is approved and has reached the marketplace. We have had biologics in the field of rheumatic and immunologic diseases for over 20 years and many other specialties uh, for less than that. Biosimilars are not generics, and uh, as we will go on to explain, there is an abbreviated pathway for approval that must demonstrate what we call a, them to be highly similar to the originator product. So there needs to be a, an originator biologic. This has to be de de demonstrated to be highly similar. There can be no clinically meaningful differences. And then ultimately, this reaches approval. There's a concept of interchangeability, which we'll come back to later, uh, which is a very uh, even higher bar. So the process of demonstrating biosimilarity, there's three basic principles. Uh, first, there must be a, an originator compound where there's clinical efficacy and uh, safety that has been demonstrated uh, to reach regulatory approval. The biosimilar must come along and demonstrate no significant difference from its reference product in terms of safety, purity, and potency. And then finally, uh, as I will go on to demonstrate, there are no differences in safety or efficacy between an approved biosimilar and its reference product. Note that I said it is not more efficacious, nor is it safer, it is highly similar. This next slide really nicely summarizes the uh, approval pathways, both for the originator compounds, the established biologic, and the biosimilar pathway. And as you can see, on the left, there is an inverted pyramid. The biologic is produced, there is rigorous analysis, there are some preclinical studies that demonstrate particularly safety and lack of toxicity. We then understand the clinical pharmacology by going into phase one trials. And then the bulk of the studies are these rigorous and, and dramatically large clinical studies that now uh, are done in thousands of patients, generally at hundreds of sites throughout the world. The biosimilar pathway on the right really it is an inverted pathway where the uh, regulatory approval process says you have an originator, demonstrate that you have a molecule uh, that has the same amino acid sequence, and then demonstrate through a series of analytic and preclinical studies that it behaves the same way, both immunochemically, immunophysically, all the properties that go to demonstrate this high degree of similarity. Then small clinical trials are done to demonstrate highly similar pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and then 
a, a small clinical trial in a representative disease may be enough to push this molecule over the finish line of biosimilarity. So the stepwise approach for biosimilar development is shown nicely on this slide. The preclinical stage is uh, the most robust. These in vitro studies assessing all the sophisticated chemical analytics to demonstrate uh, binding uh, ability to uh, function as the originator molecule. If all of these studies, both chemical and immunologic, are highly similar, and then there's a determination whether in vivo studies are even needed. They may not be. The in vivo studies then will be done and to determine whether they are highly similar. From there, if all of the preclinical packaging shows this highly similar fingerprint, then it uh, goes into human studies looking at PK, PD, demonstrating this virtual highly similar picture to the originator, and then finally a clinical trial dimension of small architecture to demonstrate equivalence in efficacy and safety. The term that is often bantered about, and if you pay attention to the biosimilar literature, is the totality of evidence approach, and that's what the regulatory agency is looking at. It's not looking at just whether it's pharmacokinetically similar, whether there's a clinical signal, whether there's a safety signal, or whether the uh, physical chemistry or immunochemistry uh, are similar. It is all of these things put together in a package that provides a, a basis for direct comparison against the authorized or licensed reference product. On the basis of that, the totality of evidence will be judged up or down. Another term that is often used in the biosimilar world is reverse engineering. I think this is interesting. I'd like to spend a minute on this. If one takes the challenge of developing a biosimilar, the first thing you should ask is, well, what is available in the private domain? How can they just copy these originator drugs that took so long and so much money to produce? Well, in the public domain is the primary amino acid sequence of the originator biologic. But that's about where the reliable information ends. So based upon that, then a system, a biologic system, has to be developed to make a recombinant uh, protein uh, of identical amino acid sequence. That means it has to have a vector produced that contains the DNA to encode this. That means that a cell line has to be chosen. And even if we know the cell line of the originator, we will not have the exact same cell line as we make our uh, biosimilar. We also can test the originator to find out uh, what its binding properties are, what its other physiochemical and immunochemical properties are, and we can test whether ours are, are highly similar. And then finally, we can move into a clinical trial to and compare it pharmacokinetically and pharmacodynamically to the originator and then do a clinical trial to demonstrate similar efficacy and safety. This diagram demonstrates the profound complexity of the extensive analytical characterization required to improve a biosimilar, requiring not only knowledge of primary structure, but higher order structure. Proteins have primary, secondary, tertiary, and sometimes quaternary structures. There are biologic functions, which I'll mention in a minute. And then the drug, as it is packaged, has to have an environment that will allow it to uh, be constant and excipients are added just as they are to the originator uh, that will stabilize it. All in all, uh, this produces our totality of evidence. This diagram demonstrates the biologic similarity that has to be demonstrated. And for these molecules, which are largely immunoreactive, as say things such as target binding, the ability to neutralize, can it uh, activate complement, mediate complement dependent cytotoxicity, what is its FC binding characteristics, and a number of other uh, analytic assays. So there is a tall measure of these ex vivo immunobiologic functions that have to be looked at. So now as we look at the clinical studies and biosimilar development, here we have to start with human pharmacology, looking at PKPD, looking at the immunogenicity assessment, something that we'll talk more about later, 
this is vital for biosimilar approval process. Then we do comparative studies to demonstrate a comparative level of efficacy and safety. And then we will extrapolate a term that will be defined later as to its approval process across other drugs. And finally, try to achieve the high bar of interchangeability, which remains to be discussed. So in summary, biologics, including biosimilars, are complex drugs that cannot be made generic. The process of biosimilar development and approval is based on a complex and robust ex vivo program supplemented by a small but carefully done clinical program. Approval of biosimilars is based on the totality of evidence. 